Okay, so let's get started. I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Keith Keating. With a career spanning over 20 years in learning and development, I would like to hand the session over to you. In various areas ranging from instructional design, leadership coaching, operations management, performance improvement and process transformation. More recently, Keith has been leading clients on the design and execution of their global learning strategies. Uh, regardless of the role, problem solving is at the heart of everything that Keith does. He studied design thinking at MIT Sloan School of Management and found design thinking was a perfect tool to add to his problem solving toolkit. Since then, Keith has been utilizing design thinking to help clients tap into understanding and resolving unmet customer needs. So Keith, thank you very much for joining us today and I would like to hand the session over to you. Absolutely, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, no, we can hear you fine, Keith. All right, perfect. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are dialing in from. So thank you for joining today's session, Design Thinking on Theory, and we'll be having application coming up next week. So a quick high-level overview for today is our agenda. I want to start this morning talking about high-level overview of design thinking. Then we'll go through design thinking in practice, some examples of how it's being used, talk about the value of design thinking, ways that you can build up your skills on design thinking. We'll stop for Q&A. Then we'll go through a bit more around the phases of design thinking. We'll talk about some other resources, and then we will wrap up with a second Q&A session. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure some of you may famil be familiar with a little well-known company called BlackBerry. In fact, they were probably my favorite uh, device to use. The keyboard was a lot more fun and easier. So once upon a time, year was about 2007, and BlackBerry was on top of the world. They owned approximately 50% of the world's share of the smartphone market. But within four years, BlackBerry would be on the verge of bankruptcy. So how does a company go from controlling 50% of the world's smartphone market to less than 1% in such a short amount of time? And the answer can be summed up with one quote from BlackBerry. We believed we knew better what customers needed than they did. We believed we knew better what customers needed than they did. So BlackBerry heard their customers. They just didn't listen. When customers would say, we want a different type of keyboard, BlackBerry would say, well, you might think you do, but if we change the keyboard, your device won't hold the battery as long, and you're going to have to be charging it a lot more, so we're going to leave it the way that it is because we know best. Customers would say, we want to be able to browse the internet on our device. BlackBerry would say, well, that's not really possible because we can't do it yet. And if it was, it wouldn't render properly. So again, we're going to focus on what we know how to do best and what our company is based on. So at the same time, a smaller known technology company, Apple, which had been at that point predominantly focused on computers and the iPod, introduced their first smartphone device, of course, the iPhone. Within four years, they would become the market leader and would stay on top of the market for a number of years. So what was the difference between BlackBerry and Apple? And Apple's approach can also be summed up in one quote. We focus on people's needs and desires rather than only the needs of the business. So they focus on the people and they focus on the needs and desires of those people. And that is the core essence of design thinking. So what is design thinking? It's a set of principles for creative problem solving. It's a methodology that asks us to take a step back from what we're trying to solve for and who we're trying to solve for and uncover and look at the root cause analysis of what that problem actually is before we jump into problem solving. It helps us lead to human-centered products, services, and internal processes. 
And this is an important distinction because normally you hear design thinking associated just to product design, but there's a whole other use case for it around services and internal processes, which is the area I focus in and we'll be talking about today, especially as it relates to learning and development. And of course, design thinking helps to unlock the needs and the problems of our end users, even when they don't necessarily know what they are or they're not able to articulate them. And it helps us as business partners get to the root cause and really understand what it is that they're trying to tell us. At the end of the day, design thinking is a focus on people. Another part of design thinking is really helping uncover the voice of the customers I was mentioning. And one of my favorite examples of how the voice of the customer works um, I came across recently and wanted to share. So oftentimes when we talk to our customers, they'll explain what they want in their own vocabulary and describing it their own way. So for example, here's a customer that's talking to us and they're saying, all right, we want to have a swing in a tree and we want it to have a few rungs on it. That's how the customer explained it. But the project leader or the intake specialist or the business partner, what they heard was, we want to have a swing in a tree. And so literally, they're trying to put a swing in a tree. And then once we bring in somebody else to help us design the solution, they've heard the same thing. We want to put a swing in a tree. And so, all right, well, we can't just literally put the swing in, so we've got to actually lift the tree so that it has space so we can put the swing in the tree. And then when we bring in our performance consultants or our business consultants, they're thinking a much more lofty design, and we want to put a nice, comfortable swing in a tree. And so we're going to put a chair in a swing in a tree. But really, at the end of the day, all the customer actually needed was something of a much more simple design. Could have just been a tire with a rope in a tree that still is able to swing. And so often our customers aren't able to explain what it is that they actually need. And design thinking helps us take that step back before we start building out that swing to then realize that that's not actually what they wanted and helps us uncover and cre help them create the words that they need to use to describe what that problem actually is. There are five stages of design thinking. Empathy, define, ideate, prototype and test. In the empathy phase, this is where we learn about the audience. And so you'll notice we're not just starting with the problem. We actually take a step back from that and we start with our end users, with our audience. Yes, a customer has brought us a problem, but we're not going to immediately jump into solving it. We're going to take a step back and we're going to understand the customer. We're going to understand the end users who are impacted, that are having the challenge, and we're going to learn from them what the actual problem is that we're trying to solve. Once we've gone out and we've learned from them, then we move into the define phase. And this is where we define the problem statements. We synthesize everything we learn from the empathy phase and we create our problem statement. Once we have our problem statements, then we begin the fun part, which is the ideation, brainstorming, creating solutions, coming up with as many wild and crazy ideas as we can. And then we start to narrow them down and we identify areas that we want to build one or more representations of, quick representations, which is called prototyping. And once we have a prototype or a couple of prototypes, then we're going out and we're testing these ideas and we're getting the user's feedback. So when you look at the five phases, it looks like they're linear. But the reality is design thinking is nonlinear and it's iterative. So once you've gone into the define phase of the ideate phase, you might realize, you know what, I don't know that we're actually clear on what we're brainstorming or if the ideas that we're coming up are even working. So you go back and you engage your end users and you make sure that you're on the right track. Or you even engage and include your end users in the ideation process. Help them brainstorm with you. Once you get to the test phase, you'll probably learn that a couple of your ideas were wrong or they failed, or they aren't adopted in that type of environment. Not a problem. Design thinking is about failing fast, quickly, moving forward, and trying again. 
So again, it's nonlinear, and it's iterative, and it's quick. There's a lot of failure in design thinking, but that's how we get to the successful, successful portion. When you look at these five phases, it, you're probably thinking, well, I do that. When I come up with an idea, I prototype. Or, of course, we go out and test. Design thinking is a powerful tool based on these five phases working together in unison. So when you look at this, you'll notice that the icon that we use is a hexagon. And there's a reason for that. The hexagon creates the hive. And the hive is actually the strongest forming natural, <clears throat> excuse me, natural creation in nature. And the hive, although each piece is individually important, it's when the hive works together that actually creates that strongest forming function. Here's another example. In your kitchen, you probably have flour, or for me I have coconut flour, bananas, and eggs. These ingredients are perfectly fine on their own, and you can use them, and you could even eat all three individually. But when you put those three together, they create something much more powerful than they do on their own. They create pancakes. And you actually can just make pancakes with only those three ingredients. And so as Aristotle once said, the whole is greater. What's the difference in of its parts? And the same is true with design thinking. The five phases working together in unison are much stronger than they are individually on their own. One of the questions I always get asked is, what's the difference between problem solving and problem finding, which is what we hear about a lot in design thinking? And are there other methodologies that can do the same? Or is this different than Six Sigma or Agile? The answer is, there are a number of problem-solving methodologies that exist, and they all function very well. Lean Six Sigma, Agile, PDCA. They start when you have the problem identified, and you're wanting to make sure that you're doing that thing, that you're solving that problem correctly. Design thinking takes a step back before that, before we start jumping in to solving that problem, and it helps us with problem finding, to make sure that we're doing the right thing, that we're focusing on the right solution. Because often, as a consultant for many years, when the customer brings us that problem, it's not necessarily the right problem, or it's not the right approach. For, and they focus on the needs, and they're often not in the weeds working with the users. Someone has told somebody else, and they're executing based on somebody else's idea or somebody else's verbiage. We want to help our customers take a step back and make sure that they are doing the right thing before we do the thing right. So that's the difference between design thinking and other problem-solving methodologies. Design thinking has a strong focus on the problem finding before it moves through to the problem solving. Here's another way to look at this. So I broke down the stages or the phases of three methodologies, DMAIC, which is Lean Six Sigma, Design Thinking, and PDCA. There's a lot of similarities between the three. Define, measure, analyze, improve, control sounds a lot like define, ideate, prototype, and test, which sounds similar to plan, do, check, and act. The difference is that you'll notice that first line is blank for DMAIC and PDCA. They don't specifically have a call out or a focus on empathy, the understanding piece. Yes, it's a part of define or it's a part of plan for the other two, but it is not strong enough where it is a true core focus that has specific initiatives behind it. And that's where design thinking is different. Another question that I get asked is, is design thinking a trend? Is it another buzzword? We're hearing a lot about it recently. What's the longevity factor of it? Design thinking has been around since as early as the 1950s and 1960s. 
it began to get a lot more traction and publicity in the late 80s, early 90s with Apple using it as part of their core design functionality as uh, Stanford University created a school specifically based on the methodology of design thinking called the D School. And as a company that some of you may be familiar with, IDEO began to be more popular and did a 60-minute segment in the 90s on redesigning the shopping cart using the design thinking methodology, which you can still find on YouTube started to give design thinking a lot more publicity, notoriety, and from there it began to pick up steam and a lot of companies started using it for product design. So the answer is it's been around a long time. It's not a trend. In my opinion, it's not going anywhere. In fact, some are even considering design thinking part of the workforce of the future, future skills, based on the fact that the whole fundamental foundation of design thinking is empathy. And empathy is one of those core future skills that we need to be working on, those cognitive skills that make us human and differentiate us from artificial intelligence and robotics. So is design thinking a trend? No. Will it be going anywhere anytime soon? Not in my opinion. There's a lot of use cases for it, especially within learning and development. Anytime you have a problem that has a human on the other end of it, and it's an ambiguous problem, design thinking is a great tool to use to work through that challenge. So how do I know when to apply design thinking? Well, building off what I was just sharing about being human-centric, that's one great uh, idea to think about is, is my problem based on humans? Is it human-centered? If so, then yes, design thinking may be the answer. If you don't clearly understand the problem, or you don't have alignment within your team on what the problem is. Design thinking may be a great tool to use. Is the problem fairly complex? If so, design thinking is a great tool. Or do you just need a fresh idea or a fresh approach to brainstorming or solving a problem? Your team is stuck and you're just trying to work through this challenge. Design thinking may be a great tool to use to help you through that. So who can use design thinking? Anyone, everyone, any industry, any line of business. It's non-denominational. It's universal. In fact, here's a list of a number of companies who are big proponents of design thinking. And I'll drill down and talk a bit more about some of these companies now. So Airbnb, which some of you may be very familiar with, the founders are big proponents of design thinking. So when they initially launched Airbnb, they almost failed within the first few months. They were so busy focusing on the coding of the platform that they never stopped to identify and understand of how the voice of the customer really need or want from this. And what was happening is the initial uh, individuals who were using Airbnb to rent their apartments in New York City were taking horrible photos. And no one wanted to rent a flat that had horrible photos. And so it was going out and understanding from customers what they actually needed that they uncovered that the quality of photos was the most important criteria and, of course, ease of use. And so they took their cameras and they went out and started taking the photos for the first number of customers, and that's when the business started to turn around. During the course of Airbnb's existence, the founders also uncovered and learned that people love the idea of experiences, whether it be employee experiences or customer experiences. So they've actually changed their chief HR function to being a chief employee experience officer. And they've changed their platform and the scope of their business to now include experiences as part of their service offering. LinkedIn has recently turned to design thinking to organize a six-week program with over a 1,000 particip participants from Silicon Valley because they have an ambiguous challenge that seems to be rampant through Silicon Valley, and that is they have low employee engagement scores, and they're not sure why. They're not sure how to solve this. That's a human-centric problem. It's ambiguous. It's complex. 
So they're using design thinking to help them uncover that problem and work through a solution. Telstra is a telecom company in Australia. And Telstra has used design thinking to reimagine their onboarding experience. They were getting a lot of negative feedback about the complexity of their onboarding experience. And so they've used design thinking to help them reimagine it, to help them redesign it, and improve the efficacy of their onboarding experience. And as a result, they've improved their employee engagement. A couple of other examples. Uh, this is an example of some initiatives I was working on last year with some of our clients at GP Strategies. And the question was, how might we reduce formal classroom training time? The client was spending about 27 hours in a single week on instructor-led content for a single classroom initiative. And instructor-led training is the most costly because of the resources involved and the time we work for the business. And so through design, we created a multi-modality solution that has a digital component both before the session and after the session that helps from a performance support perspective to increase the sustainment of the learning solutions and the learning models before and after the class. The value is we've had a significant cost savings, 38% reduction in classroom time, as well as 700 hotel nights a year less, and 700 days away from selling less. So it's been a big success for this client from a cost savings perspective, and also bringing their content to a more digital approach. Another example is with a global automotive company that we were working with last year. And the idea was, what is our learner experience like? We are creating content, and our approach is about 80% WBT and 15% ILT, and that's based on what we've always done. We don't know why it's that way. It's just the way it has been. So is that the optimal ratio for our training modalities? Are we driving performance improvement, and are we giving our learners the optimal learner experience? Again, that's human-centric. It's complex. It's ambiguous. And the only people that have the answers are our learners. And so we designed the design thinking initiative around this. And what we uncovered was this is not the optimal performance for training for our end users. That there are other areas and gaps that we uncovered that they needed support with. And so we were able to refocus our learning strategies back on the learners and this created our three-year learning path with this client. In fact, this will be the use case I'll be walking through in a detailed step-by-step -step example in part two, which will be next week for design thinking. Another example of design thinking in practice is with General Electric. And this is one of my favorite examples. So Doug Deeps is a designer with GE. And he was tasked with redesigning this MR scanner. And some of you may be familiar with this. When you look at it, it's a bit scary. It looks like the machine is going to swallow you up. It looks like it's, it's scary. It's not inviting. It looks very archaic. And as a patient, it's not something that I would look forward to or feel, be comfortable with using. So he spent two years redesigning this machine. And this is what he ended up with. It's more sleek. It's modern. Um, I like that you can see through it, so it's more, a little more comfortable that you can see that there is an opening on the other end, and it's not going to swallow you. It looks more modern. But from a visual perspective, I think it's nicer. So Doug was quite happy with this. Doug started traveling around to the hospitals and the clinics where this was being installed. And on one of his first visits, he was following a family. It was a mother and father and little boy, about six years old, walking down the hallway. And as the little boy got closer to the room where the machine was located, he started crying. And the closer he got, the more intense his crying was, until eventually he was in hysterics when he got into the room. And it turns out that the little boy had to be sedated to actually use the machine. 
What Doug learned is that over 80% of all children that have to use these machines need to be sedated. So witnessing this experience of this family, Doug realized that he had failed. He failed because when he designed this machine, he designed it from his perspective, not from the end user, whether it be an adult, and certainly not from the end user, whether it be a patient. So he accepted this challenge, and he started a design thinking initiative. And this time, he included patients, doctors, nurses, children, their parents, other designers. And through the design thinking initiative, what they uncovered, just like Airbnb, is that patients love the idea of experiences. When you're using this machine, it's not normally a pleasant experience. And so you want to be transported into or to some place else so that you're not having to think about the current situation that you're in. So with that in mind, what they came up with was creating experiences to take you out of this room, like being on a spaceship, taking you into outer space, or a pirate ship that sails around an island. And they were so keen on details that they even included a pina colada air freshener to give it that true island scent, which actually solved a latent need for the parents because the parents noticed that their stress level was being reduced because it smelled like they were on a beach, that they were drinking a pina colada. In fact, some parents were asking, can we have a pina colada? And the answer was no, but you can certainly smell the pina colada. Additionally, the child sedation rate dropped below 8% within the first three months. So at this point, Doug felt that he was successful with this project. However, it took him two years and a redesign to get to this point. And so the lesson learned for Doug and for all of us is by engaging our end users up front, learning about them, learning what their needs are, and keeping them engaged throughout the initiative we don't have to wait two years to figure out that we designed a product that doesn't meet their needs. We can find out right away and keep them engaged throughout that initiative on that journey with us so that we are solving their problem out of the gate. The value of design thinking is that it puts people first. Anyone can adopt it. It helps us drive innovation and creative problem solving, and it helps us reframe business problems. One of the most important values of it, at least for me, is that it transforms us from order takers to trusted advisors. In learning and development, often we are just considered order takers. Our client, our business partner, customer comes to us and says, we want you to create a 30-minute web-based training. We want you to create a two-day ILT. Oftentimes, there's not a strong business case behind the reason for that modality, behind the challenge that they're trying to solve. Somebody told somebody told somebody who's now telling us this is what they want. And when we ask them those important questions and try and do a bit of needs analysis, they just aren't clear. And that's being an order taker. Design thinking gives us the tools and the power to take a step back and understand what our learners actually need, what our end users need, so that we can be trusted advisors. So we're not only helping the learners, but we're also helping our business partners, our customers, our clients solve for the right problem the right the first time. So if design thinking is so great, why aren't we using it more? First of all, it's risky, it's disruptive to processes. And there are many unknowns. But this isn't a bad thing. For me, this is, I think, a good thing. It's disruptive to processes. So when I often talk to clients for the first or maybe second time around design thinking, they will say, I'm a bit nervous about doing this because what if we find out that the approach to learning is wrong? What if we find out that 80% web-based training and 15% ILT isn't the right ratio? And my response is, isn't that what we want to find out? As being business partners and wanting to put our learners first, 
Don't we want to change our approach if it's not meeting their needs so that we can help them be more successful? We can help them improve their performance because that is our goal as learning development professionals. And then eventually they start to come around. So there's a bit of work that we have to do with coaxing them and making them comfortable through the fact that, yes, it is risky because we might find out that what we're doing isn't right. But that's okay. That's a good thing because then we can correct that so that we can be helping drive performance improvement. It takes practice. It does. It's not as simple as attending a webinar and then you are now a design thinking professional. It does take a little bit of practice. But what doesn't? Oftentimes it stops at theory. People will say, I get it. I attended the webinar. I've read a book. Maybe I even went to class. I know how it works. So it doesn't just stop at theory, though. It's important and imperative that you get to application, actually trying it so that you're familiar with the way that the five phases work. You're familiar with it all the nuances and the tools and the best practices that come along with each phase. Some people think of it as a one-time event versus a culture change. For me, design thinking is more of a culture change. It's a mind shift. It's not, hey, we're going to go out and do this once and then be done with it. We should always be thinking about our learners. Our learners or our end users should be at the forefront of everything that we do. But often, that's not our culture. That's not our approach. We tend to be driven by a business partner or a line of business or the customer. And the customer may not always be focused on those end users. So that's our job to help readjust that focus so that they are focused on solving their challenges. And lastly, the name is another reason why it's not being used. When you think about the name design thinking, let's break it down. Design. Design would indicate that you have to be a designer, which is not true. For me, the way I describe it is design thinking is for non-designers. And the reason the word design is in, in there is because we use a lot of design theories or design tools within design thinking, but they're very easy. They're very friendly to use. You do not have to be a designer. You do not have to be a creative. And the second word, thinking. Thinking would indicate that this is more of a thought process. That is not true either. Design thinking is hands-on work from the first phase where you're going out and you're understanding your users to the last phase where you're testing it. It's non-stop application, hands-on. So it's not just a thinking theory. It is application. So additionally, when we think about the name design thinking, it's now being associated to human-centered design. So I just wanted to share briefly a little bit about that. Human-centered de human design is an important distinction in the L&D space right now because it is a field of practice where we're focusing on that human end user. And design thinking is absolutely part of that. And in the human-centered design family, there are six, there are a number of problem-solving methodologies, schools of thought, really, that create human-centered design. The three that we focus on in learning and development create learner-centric design. So that, I just wanted to share briefly the difference. Human-centered design is the full family of the, the six components, and learner-centric design is more focused on what we use in learning and development, and that's design thinking, learner experience, and user experience, which creates learner-centric design. So in learning and development, I wanted to share with you five different use cases. And in design thinking, we change problem statements to how might we questions. And I'll talk more about that next week when we drill down into the application and more details of design thinking. But for today, five use cases of how you can think about opportunities to apply design thinking. The first one is, how might we improve the learner experience? I personally believe that this can be applied to any business, customer, industry that has a learner, which all of us will have, hopefully. We can always improve the learner experience, or we, there's always the opportunity to check in with our learners, which using design thinking is much more valuable than a level one Kirkpatrick survey 
to figure out how somebody liked the training piece that they took. So how might we improve the learner experience? Or in recruiting in HR, how might we attract and retain new talent? Again, in HR, how might we redesign the employee reward system in a way that's meaningful to employees? I have seen a number of times where HR groups will release a new, what they consider employee reward, and have it fail because no one actually checked with the employees to identify what they wanted, what was important and valuable to them. How might we improve the employee experience and engagement? And how might we create a culture to empower creativity, collaboration, and innovation? Three words, three buzzwords that I hear a lot about within companies, but oftentimes people don't take a step back to understand what those three mean to the employees. What does creativity mean? What is collaboration and what is innovation? And design thinking can help you through that. So those are five ways that you can consider applying design thinking in your space. We don't just want to start with those five. Those five are quite lofty. So what I wanted to share is three quick skill building ideas for ways that you can build up your design thinking practice and be more comfortable with these five phases. These are simple. They could take several hours to a day, two days, depending on how big of an initiative you want to make this. Technically, you could try this on your own and going through the five phases. I recommend trying this with a few other people. Maybe it could be a couple of colleagues. It could be family members. It could be friends. And you spend an afternoon together thinking about applying the five phases to these three ideas. So the first one is reimagine a wallet. So how might we reimagine a wallet? So think about the function of a wallet. Why do we have a wallet? What's the purpose of it? What is the business problem or problem that a wallet is solving? Well, it carries things for us. Now for me, I lose my wallet occasionally and I would say every time I leave the house, I'm in a brief panic, especially if I'm traveling, do I have my wallet? So I personally find them cumbersome and I would love to get rid of them. So how might we reimagine that? So what does a wallet do? A wallet carries our credit cards. Well, now we've got mobile pay. So do we need to be create, carrying credit cards? Carries our cash. Do we need to be carrying cash if we have mobile pay? What else does it carry? Our ID. Well, that's interesting. So if we have money on our mobile devices, could we look at maybe creating an ID for mobile devices? So that way we don't have to carry around an ID. So when you're thinking about reimagining a wallet, it's not just the design of it, but it's the function behind it. Does a wallet, do we even still need a wallet? How might we think about something else to replace the wallet? So that's just kind of an idea about the thinking behind reimagining a wallet. So you apply those five phases. You start by going out and talking with people about why do you have a wallet? What value does a wallet bring? What problem is a wallet solving? And we look at what that challenge is, and then we define a problem statement based on that. The problem statement could be um, we might need a new digital ID. So that's just an example for reimagining a wallet. Another example. Reimagine team collaboration. When we use the words team collaboration, oftentimes the first thing that comes to mind is SharePoint, Yammer, Microsoft Teams. But team collaboration is much more than a digital collaboration site. So talk to your team. Find out what does team collaboration mean to them. And go through the empathy phase. And what you might uncover is that there is actually a need to have better collaboration. And maybe collaboration actually means team building. And maybe that's a bit of a gap within the team, is that you need to have more team initiatives. So uncover what team collaboration means and look for a solution within what you're uncovering through your team. Or reimagine your favorite product. Pick any product and work backwards and think about what is that pro product actually solving for you and how might you make it better? 
how might you reimagine it? This was how Oral-B actually redesigned their electric toothbrush to be cordless because customers were saying, hey, we love the toothbrush, but we don't want to have to keep plugging it in to charge it. And so they actually used design thinking to redesign that product. So those are three skill building ideas to help you build up your skills for using design thinking before you jump into one of those five or maybe some other approach for trying design thinking. So let's stop here and let's have our first Q&A. Yep, so we'll stop up for a few minutes. So um, if you have any questions or if there's an area that Keith has touched upon that you'd want him to expand on, please put it into the Q&A panel and that is on the right hand side of your WebEx. So Keith, can you share a use case for applying design thinking that breaks down the five phases? Absolutely. And in the essence of time, um, I, what I'm going to say is I'm going to defer that to next week because that is what the session is based upon. So I'll be going through the Learner Experience Initiative that I led last year with the Global Automotive Manufacturer, and we'll talk about each of those five phases in detail so that you can see an actual design and thinking initiative in action so that you understand how those five phases work together and what are the nuances and the best practices and the lessons learned from each of those phases. So yes, but it will be next week. Okay, because um, we are running short on time, we'll just ask one more. Um, how is design thinking different from performance consulting? Mm, good, good question. They work hand in hand. They are not mutually exclusive. So performance consulting is a process designed that helps you achieve business results by maximizing the performance of people and organizations. So it's kind of a technical definition. And as a problem-solving methodology, design thinking is a perfect complement for performance consulting, especially because it helps to frame or reframe that potential challenge. So I think that design thinking is a great tool that performance consultants can use that helps them uncover that root cause of the performance challenge and work through the solution to improve the business objectives. So the answer is they're, they're, they're different in the terms of uh, performance consulting is uh, a role, it's a methodology, but the tool, which is design thinking, is a complement to performance consulting and will help uncover and reframe that potential challenge. Okay, everyone, if you do have questions, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, Keith, that is it for this Q&A. I think if anyone does have any, we'll answer them in the one at the end. So do you want to... Perfect. All right. So in this next part, I'm going to go through the design thinking phases in a little bit more detail. And again, we'll be going through in greater detail next week. So understanding the phases. So again, we start with empathy, where we learn about the audience. And although, yes, this is the first phase, remember I shared earlier that it, it, design thinking is iterative and it's nonlinear. So for me, empathy should be happening throughout the entire initiative. And reality, whether or not you're executing a design thinking initiative or not, we should always be practicing empathy for our end users, our learners, our audience. So in empathy, this is where we're understanding, trying to understand or feel what another person is experiencing. And so through design thinking, it helps us uncover the voice of the customer, but it also helps us remove bias. And this is an important distinction because when we are part of design thinking initiatives or when we are listening to our end users or our customers, subconsciously and consciously, we have a bit of bias. We are bringing with us a bit of baggage from our years of experience and our problem solving. And we're wanting to jump in and immediately solve based on our own thinking. And the empathy phase helps us break through those barriers and remove our own bias. And so again, um, so, so a little bit more about bias is that because of human nature, it's already working against the concept of empathy. 
And I'll share with you, uh, one of the challenges I'm finding now within the English language is people are ending sentences with the word right. So, for example, um, you like the food that I made, right? Or um, you liked that training that you took, right? That is a form of confirmation bias. So what you are doing is you are looking to validate a belief you already hold. And when you end a sentence in the word right, you are forcing that other person to disagree with you. And by them not disagreeing with you, and by them staying silent, in your mind, you're confirming the belief that you already held. So it's called confirmation bias. So just sharing a bit of a pet peeve and an awareness that try to avoid ending sentences in the word right, especially uh, from a learning development phase or needs analysis or anytime we're talking with our customers or end users because that is a bit of confirmation bias. As well as when there is uh, a pause or silence in the middle of a statement or discussion, people will try and fill that silence by creating a false consensus effect because by not allowing that other person to have that space to think and have that time to respond, we close that gap. And by doing that, it, we're filling in the conversation with our own assumptions. So that's natural uh, human nature working against empathy, empathy. So I just share those to be a little bit conscious about those two types of bias that we might be having when we're having discussions. In the empathy phase, there are three approaches we tend to follow. Try, which wearing their hats, walking in their shoes, trying to immerse yourself in the experience of others. That is a great way to learn about what they're going through, learn what they're experiencing by doing it yourself. The other is just by observing, taking a step back, being a fly on a wall, being unobtrusive, unobtrusive rather, so that you can capture insights about the situation just from what you're observing and then of course important to ask them engage them and capture what they say they do in an environment that's comfortable to them so try look and ask those are the three approaches that we practice in the empathy phase for design thinking so once we've gone out and we've understood our learners and we've taken all of that data we start to synthesize that data and then we start defining the problem statements. And so in the defined phase, this is where you're clarifying the point of view of both the end user, but also you, so that you make sure you're very clear on what that problem is. And there's a couple of tools that we use. One is the four box, where you capture what people said, did, thought, and felt. And then there's the how might we statement. And so this is where you're turning that problem statement into how might we, so that it's we're reframing it so that it's meaningful and it's actionable and it helps drive that design. After we have our problem statements agreed upon, then we move into the ideate phase. And this is where we brainstorm and create solutions. So ideate is not about coming up with the right idea. It's about generating the broadest range of possibilities. And so in the ideate phase, when we started design thinking, we started to flare out a little bit um, in our empathy interviews. And then once we have all that data, we kind of bring that focus back in so that we narrow down and we have our defined statement. But then we move into the ideate phase and we flare it out. We blow it up. We come up with as many wild and crazy ideas as we can. And then we start to narrow it down. We're prototyping and then completing our focus through tests. So after we've come up with our brainstorm and all of our ideas, and we've picked the few that we want to move forward with, we've engaged with our end users, it resonates with them, then we move into prototyping, where we're building representations of one or more ideas. We're building quick representations. And so in prototype, there are two types. There's low fidelity and high fidelity. Low fidelity tends to be the focus of design thinking. They're quick, they're inexpensive, or hopefully they're free. And they really take a very short amount of time. Low fidelity prototype could be a drawing. It could be post-it notes. It could be a sketch. Um, it could be working with your vendors to get a free uh, prototype of some type of product. 
But again, it's quick and it's iterative. And essentially, it is an MVP, which means minimal viable product. So something that a user can react to and give you feedback. High fidelity prototypes tend to take longer. Could be from redesigning the shopping cart to have money as an investment. They tend to have some approval processes. So that's why we focus on the low fidelity prototypes. And once we have our prototypes created, then we test these ideas and we get the user feedback. And so when we're prototyping, we're thinking about creating it as if we know we're right, but then we want to test as if we know we're wrong. So in the testing phase, you're creating these authentic experiences for your users to test out your prototypes. You're refining the prototypes based on what you learn, you're refining the solution, and then of course you're also testing and refining your point of view to make sure that you're still focused on that correct problem, and that the problem hasn't not evolved, which is one of the value of design thinking be, being so quick, is when you wait six, eight, nine months to have that solution and get back to your users, often those, pro, those problems have evolved, and now you're trying to chase and solve something new. That's where the prototyping comes in, is that it's quick, it's iterative, we fail fast, forward quickly, and we try again. So a couple of final thoughts. Design thinking is not a solution for every single problem. We don't want to be overusing design thinking. Um, it is human-centric based. When a problem is complex, when you don't have alignment on what that solution is, design thinking could be the tool to use to help you with that. Remember that end users are first for all of us, whether it be learners, patients, customers. Our end users should be first and empathy helps us make sure that they are first. Design thinking initiatives are quick. On average, they're about two to three weeks in length. I have participated in some that are longer and even some that are shorter, design thinking sprints. But on average, it's about two to three weeks. And make sure that you create a place to continue fostering design thinking. It's not a one-time event. It is a bit of a culture shift. It is a mind shift. So oftentimes with clients, we'll create a space, a reoccurring space, could be a monthly event, where we continue to get together and we just talk about business problems that are out there. We talk about new innovations and ideas, and we continue thinking about empathy and ways that we can practice empathy. And so it's a space where we continue to foster that idea of design thinking. A couple of additional resources, and we're going to put these in the chat window now for you. So GP Strategies, we have a page where we have all of our resources identified. So we have our webinars, we have our podcasts, we have all of our white papers and our blogs and our articles. Uh, so we've got a place where you can go and ask questions. Uh, so definitely check out that page. Uh, there's also a book I recommend on Amazon, Solving Problems with Design Thinking. It's 10 stories um, that Gene Litka has used uh, with businesses, so it's 10 use cases. They're very interesting. Now, if you want something free instead of buying a book, there's also a blog that has 40 design thinking success stories. And it's very important for you to have these success stories in your pocket to be aware and familiar with the ways that design thinking has been applied and the ways that it's been successful, especially as you're starting your journey out as a design thinking practitioner, because you want to be able to talk about these with other people so that you can share ways that it has been valuable, but so that you can also learn from those stories. And what's great about this blog is it breaks it up by industries so that if you have a specific industry you're looking on, hey, how did they apply design thinking in banking? Or how do they apply it in healthcare or education? This is a great resource to use for that. And then lastly, IBM has created a free online MOOC. A MOOC is a massive open online course, so it's, it's an online course that you're taking. It's free. Uh, it, it is, it's a great tool to use, especially as you begin to learn more about design thinking. It's, it has badging. It has some quizzes in there. Uh, so I really enjoyed going through that MOOC and recommend, especially since it's free, to take a look at that. As an additional reminder, part two of design thinking application is next Thursday, 
same time. If you are not able to attend, go ahead and register, and then the link will be available to you after so that you can listen to the webinar, watch the webinar at your convenience. And again, we'll be going through the design thinking use case and a detailed step-by-step -step for each uh, phase of design thinking. So let's stop here. We've got a couple of minutes left and see if there's any other questions that may have come through. Yep, so we do only have a few minutes, so we'll try and get through as many as possible. Again, any questions or areas that you want Keith to expand upon, please put them in the Q&A panel. Uh, while we wait for the questions to come in, just a reminder that the slides and the recording of today's session will be sent to you via the email that you register with. Um, normally it takes about 24 hours, so please do bear with us while we action that. Okay, so first question. I have found bias is one of the hardest areas to negotiate with business, design and technology partners. Would businesses need to employ research specialism to help with their empathize stage? Mm, great question. So, in my experience, we have not uh, employed a, a specific research analysts. So, I like to use the actual team. Um, so, I'll give you an example. With a client recently, um, they had no experience with design thinking. So the first step is I walk them through this same type of session that we went through today and get them some overview, talk about the value behind it. Then we do some mini design thinking sessions to get them comfortable with each of the five phases. So I'll spend about two hours on each of the phases going through the best practices, talking about the approaches that we're going to be taking. So essentially, my goal is to upskill the team so that they can be a part of this experience because what better way to have them learn about their end users, learn about their business than being a part of this so that they can hear from those end users themselves. That being said, the bias portion in the empathy phase is probably the most challenging. I'll give an example. The last company that I was working with their, their only focus was the LMS. All they wanted to do was to go out and validate that the LMS was working and it was the right solution, which that is completely inappropriate for design thinking because they are bringing their bias, they're bringing their um, preconceived notions, and all they're doing is trying to validate. And that's not a design thinking initiative. So it took some significant coaching through empathy to get them to recognize that. And I'm going to talk about that more in the next section about the best practices and how to work through that because the empathy phase, when you're prepping before you go to those interviews, takes some significant work. So it took me about a week, um, almost full time with this team to coach them on how you brainstorm questions appropriately that are non-biased, non-leading, open-ended. Uh, we went through and we did dry runs of interviews so we practiced within each other. Then we went out and we grabbed random people and we practiced with them just so that everyone could get comfortable with how to ask questions from an unbiased approach. In the end, we were successful, but the empathy phase does take time to practice and to upskill the team. Okay, great. Um, next one is, how futuristic is design thinking? Uh, interesting question. So, futuristic. Um, you know, the definition of futuristic is, is you know, re relating to the future or being modern or advanced. So, I don't consider design thinking advanced, necessarily. Um, I do consider design thinking part of, and I mentioned this earlier, part of our future skills, um, workforce of the future, because of the fact that it is all based on empathy. And empathy is really what differentiates design thinking from the other methodologies. That and the, the time constraint, because it is so quick. So um, I think the answer is design thinking helps to fuel innovation. And it's as futuristic as you allow it to be, depending on what your definition of futuristic is. Design thinking encourages you to open your mind, look past your bias, look past your preconceived notions about the need or the problem, 
And that's really where design thinking brings that value. So if the solution involves a product or process or service being futuristic, then yes, design thinking can, can help be futuristic. But for me, design thinking is a skill of the future. Uh, unfortunately, we look like we've run out of time now. So um, we'll go ahead and start wrapping things up. Uh, so thank you, Keith, for today's session. A reminder of what he said, our next session is same time next week, 11 a.m. Uh, if you want to register for that, then you can go on to our gp-ltd.com page and the registration form is available on there. Um, if you want to contact Keith about anything um, offline, or anything, you can go on to his LinkedIn and contact him through there or his email address is on the screen now, so you can contact him through that. And yes, so, so I forgot to mention that. Please do uh, send me a LinkedIn, uh, add me on LinkedIn because uh, I post probably at least once a week, whether it be a blog, an article, podcast, and would love to continue the conversation with you and ask and answer any other questions you may have, but just hear about, learn about your journey through design thinking. So please do add me on LinkedIn. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, so yes, the recording of the slides and the um, recording of the session will be sent to you, as I said earlier, through the um, email that you registered with. So please allow 24 hours for that to be actioned. Okay, we hope to see you soon or see you next week for the next session and we hope you have a lovely day and see you next week.